Welcome back. We spoke earlier about our very splintered media environment and the impact that is having on democracy. And one of the issues that comes up repeatedly is regulation. Should we have it? What would it look like? Who would set the standards? Who would enforce the standards? Those are some of the things we're going to discuss today with our great panel. Let me introduce them. Nancy Ancrum is editorial page editor for the Miami Herald. Ellen Chen is professor at the Sturm College of Law at the University of Denver. And David Kay is a clinical professor of law at UC Irvine. Also, he was a UN special rapporteur on freedom of expression from 2014 to 2020. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nancy, I'd like to start with you. So the current discussion about regulation really does center about, around social media. And we heard Maria Ressa speak passionately uh, earlier today about the need for government to police social media and protect its citizens. From where you sit, do you agree with the premise that social media is corrosive to democracy? I... I think it can be corrosive to democracy. I hear, we hear more about the corrosiveness than we do about what it does to encourage democracy. All sorts of democracy loving people and organizations have been allowed to, to coalesce around issues, to come together, to fight for the integrity of the institutions that, that do uphold our democracy. Uh, obviously, bad news does go, go farther, and we do need to address that corrosiveness. I don't know that government intervention is the way to do it, though. I think uh, members of the panel will agree with you on that. Alan, I would like to talk with you for a moment about some of the things that the platforms are already doing. They have deplatformed Donald Trump, for example. Uh, they label content, they take down content. Is that effective? Is it consistent? Is it anywhere near enough? Sure. I think so. I think, I, 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 like, like Nancy, I'm skeptical about the prospect of government regulation, of, especially about the content on social media. Uh, for better or worse, social media companies are, 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 are publishers and they have their own First Amendment rights and editorial rights of mm -hmm. control. And so, uh, but, but what, perhaps one thing that the debate about regulation has prompted, has done is prompted social media companies to take it upon themselves uh, to ins adopt certain mechanisms. So for example, um, uh, increased sort of efforts at fact, independent fact checking uh, and, and, and sort of being able to promote independent fact checking sites. Um, uh, some companies have, uh, like Facebook, have started notice or labeling requirements, um, indicating the, the, uh, where the uh, reader or the consumer can identify the, the direct source of the stories that they're reading. Um, and uh, outside of the the, so the the major companies, there are some technology startups that are now starting to develop some artificial intelligence mechanisms for uh, to to promote and, and and make it easier to detect uh, fake news and misinformation. I think those types of uh, private market-based solutions are probably uh, b both both likely to be upheld uh, uh, and and also maybe more effective than government regulation. Uh, David, the right often says that when social media companies take this kind of a step, they are trying to silence uh, the right end of the spectrum. Are they correct? Th there's no evidence. <clears throat> excuse me. There's no evidence that there's any kind of sort of political bent uh, of the platforms. I have not seen that evidence. It's, in fact, you might look at it the other way and see that the platforms have offered enormous space for, for extremist content. Um, and, you know, if you look at the top 10 sites on Facebook, for example, they're very often sites that are popular on the right. And so, so I really don't see it that way, but, but I do see that the platforms over the last several years have, as, as Alan suggested, created a kind of rich set of rules that almost, I mean, if the question is about regulation, it almost looks like they're the regulators. They're the governors of this space. And so that's been, I think, part of the result of the public uh, concern over their impact on on public space. And, and I think that that's something that we need to take into account as we move towards uh, regulation. So do we want Mark Zuckerberg, for instance, to be governing what we're reading on social media, David? 
Well, no, of course, we don't want any single person to be governing, to be responsible for saying this is okay and this is not, this is kosher and this is not kosher. I mean, that's, that, that, is a, that is a threat to the public space. But I also think we need to be mindful of the fact that the platforms are not simply one thing in one place. You know, the platforms in the United States, for example, are part of a rich environment of freedom of expression and media. Nancy will tell you, I mean, the newspapers are obviously suffering in, in many respects at the moment, but they are a part of a big conversation as compared to a place like Cambodia, for example, where you have state media or you have Facebook. That's not to say that Facebook is necessarily a, an unalloyed good, but it's a very different conversation. And so as we think about regulation, we also need to be thinking about the impact of any step that we take on those places where actually the platforms are serving as, as a place for public debate that it isn't otherwise available. Can I follow up? I would just like to, uh, I would like to piggyback on to what he said. The question was, do we want Mark Zuckerberg to be the arbiter? Uh, the answer is no, but it also uh, calls, into, calls to question who would be the arbiter? Uh, what values and what principles um, are being subscribed to? Mainstream media newspapers in particular have do have a set of values that we mostly buy into uh, just across the board in terms of truth, in terms of libel. And I mean, that's determined by law and in the courts too. Uh, in terms of, of fairness, uh, many newspapers have disabled their comments section because they cannot adequately uh, monitor them and the speech can get very, very hateful. But whether we're talking about a Mark Zuckerberg, private enterprise, or government regulators, who will be those arbiters? I, I don't trust, uh, especially in these fractured times, I don't trust there to be uh, a disinterested set of, of uh, arbiter, arbiters putting together regulations. So ju just to follow up on that, um, you know, uh, it's an imperfect uh, mechanism, but Facebook did try to set up its own internal, what they call the Supreme Court of Facebook, just sort of colloquially. Um, and they, they were deliberate in choosing, uh, they, they wanted to take the, the, the focus off of Mark Zuckerberg and say, we have an independent set of evaluators to, to help us review any content decisions and deplatforming uh, decisions. And they, they consciously chose both conservative and, and, and liberal uh, 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 people to, to place on that board. It, I don't think it's a, a perfect system, but I, th I think, again, it's, it shows an effort, I think a good faith effort on Facebook's part to try to come up with an independent, a more independent mechanism uh, about uh, 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 reviewing their decisions about content. So we've been talking about the big boy, Facebook. Twitter also has taken steps to deplatform and monitor speech on its on its uh, on its site. But don't people who um, have very strong and perhaps outside the bounds uh, political and other views don't they just migrate to other platforms that are not as attentive and are not doing anything about what's posted? David, do you want to tackle that? Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And, and that's certainly true in, in the United States. So in North America or in Europe, where you do have a multiplicity of platforms. I mean, the problem is that these small, well, it's either a problem or a benefit, depends on which side, you know, what your perspective is. Those smaller platforms simply don't have the reach that many of the people would like to have. I mean, they're on Facebook. They're on YouTube, they're on Twitter because they have enormous reach. There's billions of users and, and also the attention of the media to those platforms is so extraordinary that when they're deplatformed from those places or when, you know, when the rules around hate speech or discrimination or misogyny are actually applied against them, that really deprives them of an audience. So, so that can be an effective approach. Now, of course, in these other places, we also need to be mindful of the fact that they can be organizing. You know, it, we're o just over a year after January 6th. I mean, we need to be clear that extremist kind of content isn't just about the content, it's also about the connections that people make. And so I think we need to be mindful of those. But I think the big dominant platforms are the ones that, 
we, we need to be focusing on when it comes to that very specific question about their impact on democratic institutions and public life. Alan, do the platforms really have a true interest in stopping misinformation and disinformation and, and highly toxic information? It makes money for them. Yeah, I think that's a great, a great point and one that I, I struggle with personally in thinking about these issues, uh, which is, as, as the earlier panel discussed, it's, it's really about the business model, right? And so, um, and it is true, uh, there's uh, cognitive psychology studies that show that people uh, are more attracted or more likely to click on stories that make them angry than, than, uh, than stories that sort of make them feel pos more positively about the world and about democracy. Um, and I think that's a significant problem. But again, I, I think the, the, the deplatforming decisions that many, uh, that Twitter has made, especially, I think, um, uh, are, uh, there's no question that that's costing them some money because they're, 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 losing, they're losing people uh, from the platform. Um, and so that's not completely in their economic interests. Uh, and I do think that the public pressure, there's, there's, there's no great, there, there has been uh, no time since the 2016 presidential election where the, the public concern about uh, misinformation has been greater. And I think that that public attention and that public pressure, in addition to maybe the threat of government regulation, even that if that regulation is unlikely to uh, come to fruition, um, is putting that kind of pressure on the platforms to make their own types of deplatforming decisions. And, and, and I hope that, and I don't think that um, there's a lot of anger toward Facebook and Twitter. I don't think they're maliciously trying to undermine democracy. I think, uh, and I think they're trying to respond uh, in good faith, to tr at least part, at least a partly in good faith to deal with some of these misinformation problems. Alan, I think that one of your concerns is the First Amendment. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you fear regulation could uh, could interfere with that. Sure. Um, so, uh, the, uh, as I said earlier, uh, social media companies have their own First Amendment rights, and uh, as First Amendment doctrine is currently constructed, and this sort of goes to uh, an important point that Nancy uh, was making, which is who do you trust to make the decisions about what we hear and what we consume and read? Um, and it's, it, it, you know, for better or worse, it, it, it shouldn't be the government. Um, and that, that's exactly what the First Amendment uh, protects us from. And um, under current First Amendment doctrine, uh, the government is really not permitted to regulate even false speech except in certain circumstances where there is a legally, it causes a legally cognizable harm. So fraud, for example, is an area where the government can uh, uh, easily regulate false speech without um, violating the First Amendment. Um, but that means that they have to show a pretty direct tie between the lie and a particular harm to particular people. Um, when you're talking about the diffusive, the, the diffuse kinds of harms that uh, misinformation causes to democracy, and, and I, I acknowledge that those are serious concerns. It's much harder for the government to identify um, exactly how that, where where the harm lies, um, and that makes it unlikely that most direct regulations, certainly direct regulation of the content on social media, would be struck down by uh, virtually any federal judge in the country as a violation of the First Amendment. So, is there a little irony here that our commitment to the First Amendment could have the effect of undercutting democracy, David? Um, yeah, it's a really great way to put it. I guess I would step back and, and, and say first that, look, the First Amendment is only applicable in the United States. And these are global platforms, you know, for which the vast, vast majority, I mean, almost 90% of Facebook's user base, for example, is outside the United States. And people outside the United States couldn't care less about the First Amendment. In fact, they think that our First Amendment is overzealous in protecting the rights of speakers as compared to the rights of audiences and public institutions. And, and there's a framework. I mean, there is a set of values. They're in international human rights law that is very protective of uh, a freedom of expression and freedom of opinion and the right to assembly and privacy. That standard at least recognizes that there are some ways in which you can restrict expression as long as you meet a very high bar and there's certain uh, principles around that. And I think that that set of standards, particularly if the companies adopt those standards rooted in human rights law, which 
as we saw in the Facebook oversight board that, that Alan mentioned before, they are actually looking to that framework of freedom of expression, of international norms in order to make their decisions. I think that's actually a pretty useful direction to go that also gives us some room to think about how other stakeholders, other than simply governments, uh, can be involved in assessing uh, you know, whether the platforms are behaving in an appropriate way, given their impact on, on the public. You know, I, I wish that the First Amendment uh, were as triggering among American citizens as the Second Amendment is. And I think that what people don't realize is that the First Amendment really empowers them to act, to speak out against speech they find offensive, to um, withdraw themselves from uh, certain commercial interests, um, say like Spotify, it's not a First Amendment really issue, but uh, it, that to me was the market working. Uh, maybe you don't shut up Joe Rogan, but maybe, you know, big name prof profitable um, artists withdraw their material and that too has an effect. I, I do wish there were a way to uh, uh, really inform people that the First Amendment is there for them um, outside of um, hate speech, extremism, uh, and, and so forth. Alan, one approach that's being discussed involves Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which would make the platforms responsible for user-generated content. What's your reaction to that approach? Would it work or not? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a big fan of, of cutting back on Section 230's protections. I think it's just, um, first of all, I think it's unlikely that Section 230 is going to be modified in any significant way politically. Um, so the, 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 the whole, the other problem is it would be impossible to maintain any social media platform if, uh, the platforms themselves were, were liable for every single piece of content that goes out on their networks. Um, and, you know, it, in, to some degree that might create some first amendment problems imposing that direct liability on the platforms themselves. It would be, it would be like making, uh, Nancy mentioned comment sections on newspapers, it would be like making the Miami Herald liable for something that somebody posted in the comment section on a story. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's problematic. A lot, you know, lots of these things sound appealing um, uh, at first glance, but if you think about the long-term consequences of how they might affect democracy and speech uh, for, for everybody, for people we, we, we don't want to suppress, um, I think we have to reconsider them or at least think more carefully about how to address mm -hmm. those issues. Uh, David, the Europeans have been far more forward leaning when it comes to regulation of tech. I'm wondering if there are lessons to be drawn from them, both positive and negative. There are. I mean, in fact, I mean, Europe isn't all that different from where we are. Like at the present moment, the European approach to content is, is quite similar to Section 230. There's something that's, I don't want to get too technical about it, but a notice and takedown. So if, if a if a platform is not aware of any particular illegal content on the platform, they're not liable for it. There needs to be a notice element. At the end of the day, the rules aren't that different between the United States and Europe. But what the, what the Europeans are doing right now, and this is in the context of their Digital Services Act and other matters related to democracy and tech, they are pushing in a direction of transparency, basically mandating that the platforms are clear that they disclose what their rules are, how they apply those rules. And they make those disclosures, not only to the individuals who might be subject to say a takedown or a deplatforming, but also make those rules and those enforcement actions known to the public. I mean, at the present, like you mentioned the deplatforming of President Trump, you know, that's a high profile issue. It's one case that, you know, all the platforms were involved in, they did something. And so of course there's public attention, but this is happening every day and we have very little clarity into what those rules are. So I think that push towards transparency and to providing a little bit more autonomy to users and to public institutions is the direction rather than substantively cutting back on Section 230 immunities, for example. <laughs> 
Alan, there's also been a lot of discussion about whether the platform should be more transparent about the algorithms which are driving content to people. Um, do you agree with that approach and is it likely to go anywhere? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting uh, problem. Uh, it's, it's almost, it's not so much as a First Amendment problem or free speech problem as it is an intellectual property problem. And I think that the uh, what the platforms are going to resist that on different grounds, which is that this is they, they develop these algorithms um, in, in in ways that are valuable to their to the way their platforms operate. Um, I I do agree with David that some more transparency about the the rules and the application of the rules would be a, a good direction to go in, and I think that's certainly less problematic from a First Amendment standpoint. But um, the algorithm thing, I think, is gets get, that's a little bit above my pay grade. It's more of an intellectual property issue, I think, than a than a free speech issue. I've heard people suggest that there may be a middle way that perhaps they provide the algorithms to researchers or to some government entity which agrees to protect the intellectual property side of things. Um, is that realistic? Uh, be certainly less problematic, I think. Um, uh, they would have, the, I think the, the companies would have to have pretty strong guarantees that, that information wouldn't be shared with their competitors um, in order to make that work though. But, but I do think if I could jump in on this question, because I think it's, you're hitting on a very important point, Gene, which is that there are, there's sort of the role that the platforms play in deciding, you know, what goes up and what comes down. And then there is sort of, this ties back to the business model question you asked earlier, there's that issue of not just whether they are moderating content, but whether they are through their tools, their algorithmic tools, they are pushing out speech, pushing out content that might be particularly problematic. <clears throat> and the fact that that is so opaque, regardless of the intellectual property concerns around that, that, that opacity is what causes so much, I think, concern. And so yes, one, for one thing, that needs to be opened up to researchers so that they understand but also it needs to be open up to policymakers because there are real harms that can take place, maybe not harms that can be regulated under the First Amendment, but they are harms that we might put into categories that are more akin to fraud and other standards of, of essentially manipulation that really are deeply problematic. At the very least, we need to know how that operates and, and we don't have a good grasp on that at the moment. Uh, Alan, we have a question coming in, which uh, sounds like it's tailor-made for you. This is from John in Boulder, who asked, does free speech need to be defined to outlaw lies and threats, building on Oliver Wendell Holmes, not allowing to shout fire in a crowded theater? Sure. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of, lot of times when we talk about free speech issues, um, we, we're dealing with the hardest uh, problems our society uh, uh, addresses. That is, we don't the Supreme Court doesn't generally deal in cases involving uncontroversial nice speech. Um, it's 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 going to always involve a more problematic controversial types of expression. So threats are a different thing. So threats are an independent category of speech that are not protected under the First Amendment. Um, mm -hmm. uh, lies are a little more difficult to uh, to to regulate under the First Amendment, current First Amendment doctrine, and it's because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's we. Who do you want to be the arbiter of what's true? Uh, do you want it to be the the government? And so think about the um, think about the government that you would trust the least, and having them control uh, or define what the truth is. Um, think about I wanted to mention this earlier. Um, uh, the, so the so the Arab Spring was something where we saw both the social media uh, be a generator of democratic uh, action. And then the immediate government response was was to shut down uh, access to social media. So, um, uh, as somebody who is not is sort of very mistrustful of the government's decisions about expression, uh, I, I I I I understand that misinformation is a huge social and political problem. Um, but gov direct government regulation is not the response, not the right answer. Mm -hmm. Um, Nancy, we have a question directed at you from Clayton King, who's a student at Corbell. With media shifting increasingly into the digital space, where are media regulators lagging the most in preventing potential harms? Your thoughts? 
I, I'm not quite sure um, what Clinton means by media regulators. Uh, it's clearly not an issue for the FCC. We must self, we so far self-regulate. Um, we set our own standards. We, we believe they are rooted in long time uh, journalism standards, as I said earlier, of, of, of truth and fairness and presenting both sides, objectivity, if it's the newsroom, um, well-rooted opinion, uh, well-informed opinion, if it's an editorial board. But as far as media regulators, I just don't think that, um, I don't think that they would really get uh, a, a, le a leg up. In, in trying to regulate newspapers and their digital components. Um, Alan, we have a question for you as well. You've touched on this before, but, but because uh, we have this question specifically directed at you, how do we differentiate between freedom of expression and blatantly false rhetoric? How do we rein in or at least label potentially dangerous lies, especially for politicians without hampering freedoms? Well, that's the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Um, it, it, the the problem is that whenever we attempt to regulate um, bad speech, we the, we tend to be overbroad and, and and end up regulating or chilling uh, truthful and good speech as well. Um, you know, the late I think I think transparency, as David was alluding to, is a is is perhaps the best we can hope for under the, our current regime uh, legal regime. Um, knowing more about the sources of stories, uh, allowing people to track down where the, what the original source of a particular story is, um, and, uh, and, and sort of making people more aware of the pop, pop possibilities of misinformation uh, that they may be consuming. Uh, on your earlier panel, you were talking about sort of more civic education about um, uh, helping people understand uh, how, to, how to verify the sources that they're uh, reading and consuming and, uh, and basing their political decisions on. Um, I think that's something, an effort that we could uh, promote also. Um, David, I'd like to draw a little bit on your international experience. Um, could you give us some examples of how um, regulation or under the guise of regulation, uh, autocrats can really crack down and have cracked down on free speech in their countries? Yeah. That's a great segue from the last question. Um, you know, around the world, we, we see uh, countries, authoritarian countries, but also countries that, you know, we thought were in a democratic camp, essentially redefining journalism, for example, as terrorism. Uh, that's been the case in Turkey, for example, where there are many, many journalists in prison for merely reporting on terrorism or on conflict. We also see, in places like Egypt and in Malaysia and in other places, these attempts to basically say that the dissemination of false information, basically what they would say is reporting and government <laughs> criticism, that that can be criminalized as well. So that that I think is one reason why we need to be so careful. Not you know even apart from the First Amendment, why we need to be so careful about how we define these kinds of issues. But, but I do wanna make one other point also related to sort of the general question about regulation. I mean, it does seem in the United States that every option is a bad option or a trade-off of some sort. And, and I think there are things that we can do. Now, Nancy was talking about uh, sort of the self-regulatory model of journalism, which I think is, could give us some insights. You know, around the world, there are things called press councils. They're basically self-regulatory mechanisms that allow for other stakeholders outside of the media to present grievance when there is a particular issue of, of concern. And there's been an idea that has been pushed out there called, that, that is referred to as social media councils, where you actually bring in a variety of stakeholders. stakeholders. It could be civil society, it could be the press, it could be the companies themselves, and they can create almost like the Facebook oversight board, but for a more general cross industry approach, you know, a grievance mechanism for people to come and say, look, you're not dealing with this kind, this category of harm and you need to do it. It's not the power of the state, which is I think our main concern in freedom of expression when we give the, the government too much power, but it's the power of civil society, 
and others to really articulate what should be the rules that are adopted by the platforms. Nancy, what's your reaction to that kind of approach? You know, many news, some newspapers have in place a position called ombudsman, which becomes the the the, the kind of the the uh, interpreter of why in, in uh, a newspaper did a certain thing a certain way, usually in answer to a in response to a grievance, and they are. Um, their effectiveness, I think, has been, um, you know, inconsistent. Uh, the the um, satisfaction that the person who presents the grievance gets also is not necessarily known, but it is an entry point for many newspapers, many, many people in civil society. I would love to leave our audience with a path forward. Uh, so I'd like to, to go to each one of you and have you give one, two or three recommendations of things that can be done short of regulation that you actually think could have an impact addressing this very complex uh, media environment. Alan, why don't I start with you? Sure. Um, uh, I, so one of the things that I think has been promising has been the, uh, the increase in, in, in visibility of uh, independent fact-checking organizations like PolitiFact and Snopes. And um, I've actually worked with PolitiFact on a couple of issues and it's, it's, a, it's pretty remarkable how, how quickly they're able to research and post a story. Um, and, and, and I think that that's been an effect. And then the, some, many of the major newspapers have adopted their own fact-checkers. Uh, so, so I think that uh, that that greater awareness of the fact that we can't necessarily believe everything we read um, is something that I think this is not just thinking about civics education. This is something about democracy that everybody needs to be more skeptical and more, more careful uh, about the, the new sources we reach out to. Um, so I think that greater awareness um, uh, about the problem of misinformation and public opinion polling shows that the American people I don't, I don't know what international uh, polling looks like, but the American people are, are aware this is a problem. Uh, David, quickly, your thoughts on a few things that could be done. Sure, very quickly. One, the companies themselves should adopt human rights standards to evaluate content and also to evaluate issues around their business model. And government, to the extent that it should avoid getting involved in specific content decisions, it can still mandate transparency and it can also require companies to do their own kinds of impact assessments on all of their different products, something that is not public right now and is not required. Those are the kinds of things I would like to see. Nancy, quickly, last word. Right, I think that people need to realize the power of individual action and also group action in demanding that their media outlets um, are trustworthy and reaching out to the leaders of those outlets who should be very accessible for and, and coming up with two-way conversations. Thank you to my panel, Nancy Ankrum, Alan Chen, David Kay, you've been great. And coming up, a discussion about democratic resistance. Stay with us. <laughs>